greetings from Indian Academy of Pediatrics, uh, IAP respiratory chapter. Uh, I have with me uh, our president, Dr. Jagdish Chenappa. Welcome to you, sir. It has been it has been uh, our privilege to start uh, webinars from respiratory chapter, which every member has been asking for. You know, they wanted to have something from the chapter, and therefore. Uh, the concept of uh, webinars being made respinar and this is the first webinar and we have with us dr jagdish chanapo is going to inaugurate the first of the kind of sessions for for all of us and from the chapter we congratulate every attendee who has taken his personal time in spite of pandemics of webinars and we have overwhelming registrations of more than 1100 and thank you very much for being with us in such a short notice we have with us uh, uh, eminent speakers today and a very special invite to Professor Andrew Bush. Without taking much of the time, I would hand over today's, ses today's session, who, which will be inaugurated as well as moderated by our dear colleague, senior colleague, and my close friend and president of the chapter, Dr. Jagdish Chinappa. Dr. J Jagdish Chinappa, over to you. Uh, Dr. Subramanya, thank you very much for that uh, very kind introduction. And uh, I congratulate you also for uh, thinking about the academic program from the respiratory chapter. We know we have had a spate of webinars from various groups of the central IAP, from the state IAP, from the city IAP, from different pharmaceutical companies who are uh, so, you know, sponsoring webinars. We are having a webinar storm, literally. And uh, in this, to pick up, the webinars of real value and importance in practice is extremely difficult. And I think the first topic that has been chosen has been a fantastic topic. And I will share my screen and go through why I think that this is a very important topic. So let's start with this. Today's program, tonight's program is going to be a respinar on under five Bs. And this is going to be one of a unique program because this is going to be addressed by two very eminent people, Dr. Subramanya and Dr. Andrew Bush. Now let's go to looking at this question as to why this topic is important. One of the most frequent disorders in practice, which all of you will agree, is under five years. In a recent study, which has been done over many years, almost 15 to 20 years, 75% of all acute visas are under five years of age. They are a varied group, as you all know. And we know that in the last few years, we have various groups putting them into various classification systems. That is phenotypes, transient, persistent, multi-trigger, unitrigger. But please also understand that these are not stable over time. A patient who is once a, 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 not a multi-trigger wheeze can become a multi-trigger wheeze over time. So, and vice versa. So therefore, they are a varied group. One important thing which has come out from all these studies is that lung function in many of these under five visas is significantly affected in adulthood. Much of the COPDs you see in older adults is a result of uncontrolled and very poorly managed under five visas. And please also understand that the transient visas whom we dismiss as nothing much is not benign. Many of the transient visas will land up with restricted lung function later on. And this is a very, very important thing to note. We also now are realizing that viral infections are again not simple things. In my college days, medical college days, we thought bronchiolitis was something which is once comes, never comes again. But we now know that RSV disease can cause in a subset of children alteration in their lung function and recurrent wheezing. Rhinovirus is another virus which is known to cause problems. Then we also look at inflammation parameters in the airway. What is the difference between eosinophilic inflammation? Well, this is the group of children who will respond to steroids. Another group of neutrophilic inflammation will not respond to steroids very well. We also are now coming to know about the airway microbiome and how it alters management. So therefore, there are some groups which are now looking at long-term antibiotics in a subgroup of sub-preschool sub visas. This is a matter which has come up in the last few years. We still don't know 
whether this these subset of users are the ones who also manifested protracted bacterial bronchitis so there is a lot of things going on as far as the microbiome in the respiratory tract is concerned now we also have another issue we always thought uncontrolled asthma going into childhood will cause airway remodeling but we know that early remodeling starts as early as 3 years of age and it can progress quite significantly by the time the child is 6 years old so therefore we need to look at this as a very important thing we also are now doing lung function tests in smaller children and so we know how the pattern of this kind of wheezing affects our children now we will have to relook at our things of counseling parents as oh he's got only transient wheeze he's got only under 5 wheeze he'll grow out, outgrow it all you need is sub bronchodilator when he gets it or he's a happy wheezer don't worry you know he'll be all right so another final question is when to start how long to give steroids how long when to stop whether you're going to give it on a long term basis or you're going to give it only during exacerbations lot of questions and really we do not have too many answers so to give these answers we have two very eminent people we have dr andrew bush who is a professor of pediatrics and pediatric respirology i will go to his bio data a little later and we have our secretary dr subramanya who is passionate about this and who's right who's written many articles and books on this and he has talked quite frequently on this on this problem and i think these are the right people who can put different perspectives one is the indian perspective and the other one is going to give you a global perspective dr andrew bush is an old friend of the respiratory chapter he's been coming for our respicons and we have it's always a pleasure to hear him because he's an authority on uh, pediatric uh, respirology and pediatric pulmonology his areas of interest primarily is on airway inflammation and how to address it how to assess it how to manage it and he has looked at many many um, uh, problems as far as this is concerned he has had a huge number of students many of them are Uh, our own uh, indian uh, doctors we have uh, dr gupta we have dr sejal zaglani we have uh, many others from india who aspire to work with him because of his expertise dr subramanya of course i doesn't need any introduction to this group because he is well known all over india as a very very um, not only you know he not only informs but entertains so he keeps both your right brain and your left brain going at the same time so he i don't need to talk about all his awards and everything else because it's well known to all of us so with these few words i hope i have tickled your uh, inquisitiveness or your curiosity to look at what is going on in under 5 weeks uh, welcome dr andrew bush he has joined us now and i welcome him uh, to the uh, webinar thank you sir for joining in thank you so much and with these few words i now hand over the uh, session to dr subramanya to give his first talk thank you very much uh, dr jagdish in fact it's my lifetime opportunity uh, to be working uh, in the respiratory chapter under you and uh, very many many thanks uh, in my life and uh, secondly to have a person of his stature dr andrew bush such, such man of such a simplicity that in one mail he said yes and in the second mail he finished it off i, I don't think any one of us can do this much um, thanks to his commitment uh, to to my viewers do you know that he's if if there is any bible in the respiratory chapter the author of it is dr andrew bush if there is some question that you have to ask on anything in respirology you can just ask dr andrew bush and uh, my job is pretty simple i have to further raise your curiosity ask some more questions on your behalf and see if i if we can get the best respirology juice out of dr andrew bush that would be my responsibility therefore i would be putting uh, my views as difficulties bar solutions you know at times the slides are self explanatory at times their questions left un unanswered would be answered by dr andrew bush so i'll share my screen for all of you and you know um, greetings from indian academy of pediatrics respiratory chapter welcome to the new concept of our webinars now they are called respinars and you probably uh, uh, by god's wish 
we will wish that every monday 9 pm you will have the series of webinars going on and reaching out wonderful respirology to you i would be going to difficulties in wheezing in children and uh, all of us have faced difficulties there are difficulties which i have faced maybe i have put in myself in your shoes and thought what may be your difficulties wheezing as a symptom wheezing as a concept recurring wheezing as a problem wheezing as a pointer to a disease and what else so therefore this has always been a wonderful curious area for all of us in in the field is under 5 we so simple that we can understand and i i think it's it's as simple as these two brothers you know it's it's not that that simple but at the same time we cannot say okay i will not understand you need to understand and you are forced to understand under 5 weeks have you answered all the questions on under 5 weeks um this is this this mystery remains for all of us because the mystery is still not completely solved as far as i am concerned and if i have bush answering couple of mysteries being solved i don't know or all children with under 5 weeks same they are not same and therefore i don't know if the wheezing is heterogeneous as a symptom so wheez from my child a may not be wheez from child b and therefore the disease in question may not be the same but my question further is the same disease in different children will they behave differently and diff different children with different diseases for the cause of wheeze behave similarly you know both ways can happen and that's the crux of the matter and that's exactly what we want dr andrew bush to highlight upon are we really splitting and differentiating the wheeze you know categorizing the wheeze go on categorizing the wheeze see multi trigger episodic transient persistent and i'll tell you uh, i i remember i am a teacher medical school teacher and therefore i remember some neurologist who classified the epilepsies into so many epilepsies that none of the students could follow at the end of the day there was one category called non epileptic epilepsy you know to that extent this means that there is maddening classification that is going on and this kind of heterogeneity will will take us anywhere and i know it may make the problem more complex than simple and i i expect dr bush to address us and to make it simpler and you know a simplest thing that we can all understand and take home at the end of the day the second question which bothers every mother every pediatrician and every research worker the wheez under 5 wheez which i am addressing in that is asthma likely this is a very very important question and what asthma i understand what asthma dr jagdish understands what asthma someone else understand is it same or is it different so i call somebody asthma because it is a clinical diagnosis and i say it is not clinical diagnosis it is clinician's diagnosis and clinicians are again variable and clinician to clinician there is a variability there is variability in a heterogeneous country like ours a diverse country like ours from east to west across the india it, it's it's a wide spread area and we have huge variability of definition of asthma even though we say consensus how far this consensus is a consensus when exactly i should call them asthma in a wheez this is exactly what we want to know is it after the inflammatory mediator comes in the breath is it when the chronic inflammation starts in the lungs is it when the clinical manifestations become so obvious that every tom dick and harry can recognize it as asthma is an early diagnosis of asthma possible my question is is an earliest diagnosis of asthma possible in a visa or should we just wait you know this question again is is a burning question so therefore until and unless i am convinced when and how should i break the news on under 5 wheezing and tell them look here your child has got asthma this is not a simple wheeze anymore and you need to be very cautious you may be on low dose inhalation corticosteroids lot of us go elsewhere you know go beyond infection and somehow the life circle is such that we come back to an infection you know we have seen many diseases you know they told they are diagnosed as idiopathic or they are diagnosed immune disorders 
but later on we come to know something like infection associated immune immune associated with infection and so on and so forth so therefore my question is is there a bug that i can catch and that is responsible for the wheezing it could be a virus it could be any microbiota that we are discussing therefore diagnosis of wheezing is it clinically possible or is clinical diagnosis a myth is it that asthma is a pathological disease and that we are trying to interpret it clinically you know basically chronic inflammation and none of us can see an inflammation we can see only effect of inflammation and how effectively we can see the effect of inflammation so is clinical diagnosis enough for me to justify the starting of steroids so this is again a burning question for me and therefore i should be able to justify and so therefore taking the subjectivity to objectivity will they do some blood tests you know this is so simple draw a sample and get an answer so i wanted to know from dr bosch is it that what does that eosinophils mean is it eosinophils in the blood same as eosinophils in the airways is ige locally is same as ige in the blood is the total ige specific ige this ige that ige so many things are there so i wanted to have we have wanted to have a kind of final answer lot of indians have started doing skin prep tests of late started believing in allergic hypothesis and and you know there is there is a kind of overdoing as well as underdoing of skin prep tests so we need to have a kind of balance answer as to when and how and why we should do skin prick test there is there is asthma in evolution so at what phase a skin prick test means appropriate for us does it mean sensitization does it mean clinical symptoms how how and why and when we should interpret skin prick appropriately in a wheezing spectrum can i dare to diagnose a rarity you know this this requires a bit of boldness boldness and you know sometimes i may miss a couple of things because i would i would push in push in uh, the steroids and then you know ultimately realize that it could be a foreign body a ring a sling or a mass or a cyst i don't know all these things i can i keep it simple wheeze means an obstruction not an infection to me and therefore an obstruction is all that needs to be relieved with bronchodilators sir this is too complicated a subject for me i'll just give bronchodilators and and you know keep myself happy is it possible are the bronchodilators good enough for under five wheezing and just not start steroids in everyone okay i do start steroids do the steroids do a magic is it a magic bullet that we have discovered so that you know we can stop storm inflammatory storm is it disease modifying i think we have the answer right now that probably it's it may not be disease modifying but at the same time why we are asking this question is only because are the steroids safe although we claim we do not know the, then if were, if i were to give steroids in an under 5 visa should i give it for 15 days should i give it for 3 weeks should i give it for 3 months stop should i give it for 6 months should i give it for an year and stop should i give and then increase stabilize and then taper what way to go so we have various uh, kinds of hypothesis and recommendations that come so therefore is it continuous or intermittent steroids should i have to give montelukast we want a final answer that we have big fan following montelukast in india is montelukast a magic bulletin is montelukast is it a ma magilukast you know it 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 does some magic inside the airways so therefore people have taken this as, as some kind of alternative to you know lack of diagnosis can i give therefore some kind of macrolides assuming some kind of microbiota with dr jagdish was talking which device us to choose is is a big difficulty in under 5 wheezing although we have some consensus but there are variables as far as the patients are concerned all of you have gone for shopping you know how difficult it is to choose a sari choosing a device in in an under 5 is it should it be a nebulizer or an mdi with spacer 
if if i give is the technique reliable because lot of patients lot of studies have faced this problem that we start a study but later on you know the compliance adherence all these issues there are huge dropouts is the technique correct and is a correct technique possible in under 5 can i nebulize in covid times should i trust your advice sir because guidelines keep changing you will tell me something in 2016 you will change in 2018 you will change in 2020 and 25 so therefore i want you to give me some kind of assurance that i can trust you what makes my baby wheezing again so this is what moms ask me and what pediatricians needs to know do the same babies under 5 wheezing are they similar for example genetic gen, uh, genetic heterogeneity similarity in twins etc my elder sibling has asthma my well elder sibling is wheezing now what should i tell therefore sir should i just wait and watch you know anyway asthma will come out sometime later i'll just keep quiet right now knowing that probably it's asthma sir 5 years over can i relax now improving its age is it an illusion how to decide which one needs more follow up how should i assure this mom and you know people when they don't know they start advising so many things can i go for home remedies how to give the correct explanation to the parents and the mothers they are asking us shall i just go the way which, which is there you know just tell something and then again tell something else my last couple of questions is is wheeze by itself normal is it normal to have a wheeze in a, in therefore a normal children when and how i need to refer or instead of referring should i make little extra effort to find out what is there in the gina for me we are really confused about step 1 because once you cross once you go to the first step it is very easy because either you go to the second step or you come out of the steps but to get into the first step is the most difficult part are the guidelines possible at all in asthma and if possible are they clear are you confused i hope that i have confused you enough please do not worry answers are not easy my dear friends we have wonderful person with us a very senior professor and who is the editor of bible of respirology who has been the editor of the most prestigious journal thorax and it's my lifetime privilege that i am sharing this the thoughts with him stay safe the session on wheezing will continue next week as well if the questions remain unanswered and maybe next few weeks as well and that's that's my presentation for dr professor andrew bush to take over and uh, i hope and i'm very pleased that he took his time out of his busy schedule and clinic and and for uh, here with us for us to um, address us over to uh, dr jagdish chinappa and dr andrew bush uh, for uh, their uh, remarks and their presentations and thank you very much thank you dr subramanya for that colorful presentation of the questions that we all ask every single day and i think you have put it together very nicely um what if there are any other questions which the participants have please put it in the q and a box so that we can compile it at the end of dr andrew bush's talk so now i invite professor andrew bush to give us the answers which dr subramanya has asked so welcome sir honor to have you in our platform you can please start your presentation thank you so so much i think you have a record right i think you have a recording of this uh clearnet can you just put the recording on please and dr andrew bush can you please uh, unmute yourself I think I think, I think I think 
I can do I this can... live, but I think you have a recording I did by Zoom over the weekend, whichever you prefer. Yes, sir, I'm just about to play it, sir. Perfect. I'd like to thank the Indian chapter for honoring me with the invitation to do this webinar. It's a great pleasure. Thank you for asking me. I am only sorry that we are not face to face and I am not in India enjoying your beautiful country, your hospitality and your, and your culture. So the, I have no conflict of interest for this presentation. The aims of the presentation, I'm going to discuss my clinical approach to the child referred with preschool wheeze refractory to treatment. I'm going to describe the possible treatment options and how we are starting to be able to personalize therapy in a practical way. I want you to appreciate the potential of novel approaches to prevention and some of the successes and failures. And I will demonstrate to you that preschool wheeze is not something transient here today and gone tomorrow but signals a lifetime risk of COPD and premature all-cause mortality. We as paediatric pulmonologists need to educate our colleagues in adult medicine that actually adult diseases start before birth and in the very early years of life, and that's where preventive efforts must be focused. So this is a map of the world, obviously, and I've highlighted many different environments in the world. I practice in London, here, but the environments are different, even within a country, urban and rural, within a city. And the important message of this is that what I see in London as preschool wheeze and asthma may be different from what you see in India. And young investigators in particular who are listening, you need to go out there and find out what does Indian asthma look like? What does Indian preschool wheeze look like? What that I tell you is relevant and what you need to discover and put in place that's different for India. So don't imagine that I believe and nor should you believe that Indian disease and London disease is the same thing. So first things first, what is my clinical approach to a child referred to me with refractory preschool wheeze? Well, these children belong in one of five groups. The first is the normal child, and that's the hardest diagnosis of all. We spend our lives trying to understand the limits of normality. The second is a serious illness, cystic fibrosis. It will vary to the ge geographical location, rare but essential to get right. This radiograph shows a lot of bronchial wall thickening, higher lymphadenopathy, hyperinflation, flat diaphragms. This wheezing child, in fact, has cystic fibrosis. An asthma syndrome is the third group, and I will come to that presently. Minor problems like rhinitis and reflux, which may mimic or exacerbate wheezing symptom syndromes. And the over-anxious parents, usually first-time parents, who haven't really appreciated how much illness a, a normal child may get. So atopic wheezer, which side is normal? Or perhaps I should say, which is the abnormal side? And whichever you've chosen, you're right, they're both abnormal. This child, who's a one-year-old with, a, with at, atopic dermatitis and wheeze, in fact has this bronchogenic cyst on the MRI scan, pressing on the airway. And you can see in this bronchoscopic photograph of another case, the smooth indentation of the cyst on the airway wall. What caused the symptoms in this child? This is a 15 month old girl with four months of cough and noisy breathing intermittently. On one occasion, she was admitted centrally cyanos to the hospital, but she did not get ventilated. She didn't respond to therapy and she was referred for further investigation. You can see on this chest x-ray, there's loss of the hemidiaphragm, loss of volume, and this was interpreted at the time as collapsed consolidation in the left lower lobe. The CT scan showed this mass of bone density crossing the mediastinum, and she went on to a bronchoscopy. 
So this is the bronchoscopy. It's a fiber optic bronchoscopy. The child is breathing spontaneously. Uh, the arrow here is posterior. And you can see the bronchoscopist has gone through the false cords, the true cords, and you can see the membranous part of the trachea moving as the child breathes. But I think even from here, you can get a sensation that the lower trachea is not normal and it's much, much clearer now. You see it's slit-like rather than the horseshoe shaped, barely recognizable as a trachea. Uh, you can see just about st still see the membranous part moving with respiration. As the bronchoscopist advances, you can see some purulent secretions um, at, at about 11 o'clock here. And you can see the airway is narrowed. Do you see there's, there's this whitish mass? I wondered if it was a tooth. You can see some, you can see some granulation tissue around this. The airway is totally narrowed. Uh, the bronchoscopist doesn't dare go past the obstruction for fear of causing complete blockage to the airway by edema uh, and bleeding. And what this actually was, was a toy soldier. Do you see at the top of the mediastinum here, do you see there's a head there, a body, an arm, and a foot? This child had actually swallowed a plastic toy soldier. It had got stuck in the esophagus. By God's grace, it had not eroded into the aorta, but had eroded across into the trachea. You could see the soldier's head in the bronchoscopic video, and the child was cured by the surgeon removing the soldier. So foreign body, an important differential diagnosis, typically very sudden onset of symptoms. The mother who says, my baby was absolutely fine until, until the, the Tuesday a week ago and has coughed and wheezed ever since. And remember, a baby may not be able to bring their own hand to their mouth, but a helpful older sibling may give them a toy with a loose part that can be a foreign body. Ask specifically about choking or aspiration. The parents may not volunteer it. Listen for abnormal signs, asymmetry or a fixed monophonic wheeze, but the signs may be bilateral or absent. The ray chest x-ray may be normal. Please don't send a one-year-old for inspiratory and expiratory films because you won't get them. And if the history is suggestive, the child needs a bronchoscopy. And my colleague, Professor Duncan Geddes, claims a world record for foreign body. He did a bronchoscopy on a 32-year-old man with asthma and pulled out the top of a barrow from the airway. And the young man said, that's funny, I swallowed that 25 years ago. And because he said he swallowed it, everybody assumed it had come out in the feces, but in fact, it was lodged in the airway. This is another case, a 27-week preterm baby. You can see down in the NICU, non-intubated. Uh, you can see on the right lung, the sort of ground glass appearance typical of hyaline membrane disease or neonatal respiratory distress syndrome. With retrospect, it's actually different here. Um, the child was eventually was intubated, ventilated, eventually extubated, but was left with persistent respiratory distress. And at term, this CT scan, you can see this hugely overinflated uh, right lung. The anterior mediastinal line has been displaced into the left hemithorax. You can see the compressed left lung. And this is an angiogram from another similar case. Uh, this is, a, you can see here, this is a pulmonary artery sling. Here's the common pulmonary trunk, the right pulmonary artery, and the left pulmonary artery actually comes off the right pulmonary artery instead of the common trunk, goes across the mediastinum, narrows the, narrows the airway, uh, and, and uh, it causes compression. And pulmonary vascular rings and slings are a very important differential diagnosis of preschool wheeze. In India, I suspect tuberculosis and narrowing of the airway by tuberculous lymph nodes is more important. And you can see here some a series of panels of bronchoscopic photographs of tuberculosis. So all that wheezes is not asthma. You take a good history, carry out a detailed physical examination. And importantly, and something we've got wrong in the United Kingdom, isolated chronic dry cough with no breathlessness in an otherwise well child is not due to asthma or very, very rarely. And in England, we have overdiagnosed and overtreated cough variant asthma. 
you may well do no investigations, and that's appropriate for most wheezing children, preschoolers. If you do decide to investigate, important to do targeted investigations and a selective approach. Don't do every test on every patient. What is the limit of normality? And as I said, that's the hardest diagnosis to make. Normal child. Well, post-viral, post-bronchiolitic cough, that may go on for many weeks. Viral colds. 10% of children have more than 10 colds a year. Symptoms may last two or three weeks, and this is normal. Acute otitis media. The child may have more than three episodes a year. <clears throat> In my country, because of vaccine phobia and stupidity, pertussis is making a comeback. Very common is what I call nursery school syndrome. This is usually a first child, early placement in a child care facility because both parents are working. There are repeated viral infections with one viral cold merging into another. And of course, because it's a normal viral cold, they don't respond to medication, but usually they've been given antibiotics, bronchodilators, inhaled steroids, all sorts of stuff. My prescription, a hot lemon and honey drink for the infant, and a glass of good wine for the mother, both to be repeated as often as needed. And I would strongly commend this meta-analysis, particularly to the trainees in the audience. This is a meta-analysis of the extent and duration and frequency of respiratory symptoms in normal children. Please read it. So points in the history that you need to focus on. Is this really wheeze? In my country, parents use the word wheeze to describe many different noises, a crackly noise, an upper airway noise, and increasingly we're using a video questionnaire to ensure that what, the, that what they are talking about of wheeze is what I think of as is a whistling polyphonic musical expiratory noise. Are there prominent upper airway symptoms? Are there symptoms from the first day of life? And if an experienced mother says that their baby was symptomatic from day one of life, that baby needs investigating. Sudden onset of symptoms suggestive of a foreign body. A chronic wet cough. If a child has had a chronic wet cough every day for six or eight weeks, that child needs investigating. That is not asthma. It may be persistent bacterial bronchitis. It may be bronchiectasis. It is not asthma. Beware of the child who's worse after meals, an irritable feeder who's going to arch his back from the breast or bottle, who vomits, think reflux. Think, look for evidence of systemic illness or immunodeficiency. Continuous unremitting symptoms, that's a worry. This paper was about tuberculosis, but what you, can see, what you can see is three patterns of symptoms. This one, the first one, Recurrent bouts of symptoms, this is almost certainly a child with a cold uh, who's getting bouts of symptoms and getting better. This child with a sort of prolonged post-bronchiolytic cough, but it's gradually getting better. But beware of this one. This is the child with relentlessly worsening symptoms. That's the one that needs investigating. And it's your history and physical examination that is going to determine whether you investigate further. What about the physical examination? Well, clubbing, weight loss, failure to thrive, uh, look for them. Every so often I see on the ward somebody with chronic clubbing like this that has been missed for months because nobody's looked. Look for upper airway disease, adenotonsillar hypertrophy, rhinitis, nasal polyps. You can see a nasal polyp here um, sticking out of the nostril. Um, in my country, if you see a nasal polyp, the first, second and third diagnosis is cystic fibrosis. Look for an unusually severe chest deformity. This might suggest an alternate diagnosis. The abnormal auscultatory signs that I've touched on. Signs of cardiac or systemic disease. So, the next question, can we diagnose asthma and what does it mean for treatment? And people often say to me, at what age can you diagnose asthma? And I think I'd turn that round and say, actually, what asthma are you talking about? And this is fundamental. So what is this thing called asthma? Is it airway inflammation? Variable airflow obstruction? Bronchial hyperresponsiveness? A doctor said so. Someone somewhere once gave me an inhaler. 
or what is it? All these definitions are used in the literature. But to me, asthma is an umbrella term. It's a clinical description. Wheeze, breathlessness, chest tightness, plus or minus cough. Clinical symptoms. Just as anemia is an umbrella term for low hemoglobin. If you went to a hematologist and were told you're anemic, your next question would be, what sort of anemia do I have? What specific treatment do I need? Same as if you went to a rheumatologist with hot, red, painful joints. It's arthritis. But what arthritis? Rheumatoid, osteo, what is the arthritis? What specific treatment do I need? And similarly, if I say to you, your child has got asthma, the question you should shoot back to me is, what sort of asthma does my child have? And I'll show you what I mean. What we need to do, rather than use umbrella terms, is deconstruct the airway into treatable traits. So what do I mean? Well, the airway can respond to a toxin insult in very stereotypical ways. Just as the kidney, if it's damaged, retains urea and creatinine, irrespective of the cause of the damage. Same with the airway. Fixed and variable airflow obstruction. This could be bronchoconstriction due to airway smooth muscle contraction. It could be intraluminal mucus causing wheeze. You can lose these, if your mother smoked in pregnancy, these beautiful alveolar guy ropes that hold your airway open can be lost. But does the child have the treatable tray of bronchodilator responsiveness? If so, please prescribe beta-2 agonists. Does the child have airway inflammation? If there is no inflammation, why would you want to give an anti-inflammatory drug? Would you give an antihypertensive drug to somebody with a normal blood pressure or insulin to somebody with a normal blood glucose? No, ask the question, does this child have the treatable tray of airway eosinophilia? And if so, give inhaled steroids. Finally, airway infection and impaired host defenses. Does the child have airway infection? If so, prescribe antibiotics. Much better, look for treatable trays and treat them. This, of course, is not original. The late, very great Freddie Hargreave has been doing this, was doing this for decades. So we used to describe preschool wheeze by symptom patterns. This was the ERS guidelines in 2008, I think. Episodic viral wheeze, just wheezing with viral colds, no wheeze any other time, may not be transient, may go on into school age, no eosinophilic inflammation, don't use inhaled steroids. Multiple trigger wheeze, on the other hand, you wheeze with viral colds and with other typical triggers like excitement, allergens, it may not be persistent. Some will have eosinophilia and remodeling and will benefit from inhaled steroids. But we're learning more. This is Professor Saglani's research. You can see BAL eosinophil count in viral wheezes, multiple trigger persistent wheezes and controls. And what you can see is that both viral wheezes and multiple trigger wheezes may have airway eosinophilia and some may be normal. What about atopy? Well, if you look here, the non-atopic and the atopic, many atopics actually have a normal BAL eosinophil count. We need to do better. Just asking parents about symptoms is not good enough in the 21st century. So let's think about treatment now. Why would I want to treat a child with preschool wheeze? Well, it may be I would want to prevent disease progression, prevent disease progression from preschool wheeze to school age atopic allergic asthma. The antihistamine data, the ETAC studies were negative. I'll show you the steroid studies soon. Or I may want to treat just persistent symptoms at the time. And I'm gonna go through all these treatments in a moment. So what about inhaled steroids? The argument went, okay, inhaled steroids are great treatment for school age atopic allergic asthma. Why don't we start them early before it's developed and it will stop it developing? Great idea, but wrong. So two great randomized controlled trials, if when from Manchester, peak from the United States, uh, showed no benefit. 
In the PEAK study, two years of fluticasone in a high-risk group of patients, some small symptomatic benefit, note the zero suppressed here, but after two years treatment, the treatment stopped, the symptoms come back, there has been no disease modification. This is the COPSAC study, instead of using continuous steroids, they used intermittent steroids just when the baby was symptomatic with wheeze, and again, no benefit at all. No benefit at all. And a note of caution, this is the IFWIN study, um, airway, airway resistance, post bronchodilator on the vertical axis, the higher you are, the more obstructed you are. Here is the placebo group, uh, and you can see, uh, compared with the fluticasone group, those who were treated with fluticasone actually had worse airflow obstruction. And I would remind you, this is a double-blind, placebo-controlled, randomized trial. So fluticasone appeared to cause worse airway obstruction. Now, of course, this does not mean I'm saying never use inhaled steroids. Of course, they are fantastic treatment when properly used. But do not use them non-specifically. Do not use them unless there's an indication. So what about the role of inhaled steroids in treatment? This study, 25 years ahead of its time by Mike Silverman and Nicola Wilson, showed that continuous inhaled budesonide failed to prevent wheeze in preschool children. In the USA, this big study comparing intermittent Montelukast with intermittent nebulized budesonide with standard bronchodilator therapy showed Montelukast and budesonide were better. I should point out that nebulized budesonide is used in the American studies because this is, this is the only agent that is licensed for the under fives. I have not used nebulized budesonide for wheeze for many a long year. This study from Canada, Francine Ducharme, showed this huge dose of fluticasone, 1.5 milligrams per day at the time of viral wheeze, reduced the prednisolone requirement, but it also suppressed growth. Finally, this USA study, no placebo group, unfortunately, showed that continuous and intermittent budesonide were equally effective or equally ineffective. Now, this has been taken much further by the infant study, the first study that has enabled us to look at personalized medicine uh, in, children, in these children. 300 children, aged one to five years, at step two in the USA, they compared three-way, a crossover design in random order, daily inhaled steroids, daily leukotriene receptor antagonist, um, intermittent as required inhaled steroid, and, uh, and bronchodilator. They used a composite outcome of asthma control days and time to attack requiring all the steroids. And they pre-specified, looking for differential response, aerogen sensitization, gender, and wheeze attacks. Crucially, note that they did not pre-specify a bloody eosinophil count. And these are their data. Many of these children got better. Of those who showed a differential response to treatment, the red line, those who had daily inhaled steroids, did better than those in the blue line who had intermittent inhaled steroids, and both did better than Montelukast. And when they did their pre-specified analysis, they looked at those who were aeroallergen sensitized, and it was those who responded to inhaled steroids. They then looked post hoc at a bloody eosinophil count analysis, and they chose an arbitrary cutoff of 300 cells per microliter, and showed that if you had a raised bloody eosinophil count above 300, you were much more likely to respond to inhaled steroids. Below 300, it didn't matter what treatment you gave. And post hoc, a blood eosinophil and aeroallergen combined, and they showed that if you had a raised blood eosinophil count above 300 and were aeroallergen sensitized, this was the group that responded. And that was about a quarter of their study group. Now, note that this is post hoc. The eosinophil count is post hoc, it's hypothesis generating, it requires confirmation. So we looked at our data, we looked at induced sputum, this is very useful in school age asthma for determining airway eosinophilia, but in preschool children we found it was a very poor marker. However, if there was no bloody eosinophilia, they were highly unlikely to have BAL eosinophils. However, also importantly, 
Blood eosinophils may be driven by other atopic diseases, such as atopic dermatitis. And in a low and middle income setting where there's a heavy burden of parasites, a raised blood eosinophil count may be just due to parasites. That's what I mean when I say in India, you need to see, is infant, the infant study relevant to you? Does it need to be modified? You need an Indian study. Go out and do one. I'd really encourage you. What about Montelukas? Well, cystinal leukotrienes are raised at the time of viral infection. Parents probably won't medicate well children. So this was the preempt study, and they showed in over 200 children that intermittent Montelukast was superior to placebo in preschool wheeze and school age wheeze. And you've seen these data before, intermittent Montelukast was better than standard bronchodilator. However, in this huge study, with very nearly 1,800 patients in it, there was no difference between placebo, intermittent, or daily Montelukast in terms of, of response in the primary endpoint. And in Jonathan Griggs' weight study, again, nearly 1,400 patients, one-year follow-up, no benefit from intermittent Montelukast. So I would point out in two studies with more than 3,000 children, preschoolers, there was no benefit from Montelukast. Now, I accept that there may be one or two individuals who benefit. I suspect we've all seen those individuals. But at best, Montelukast is a minority medicine. And I'm shocked by the prescription data, which I can't show you, from England about how much is get, the prescription is going up and up and up. That should not be happening. And also important, this is a famous picture, the screen, and there are psychiatric side effects of Montelukast, as many perhaps as 20%, sleep disturbance, night terrors, behavioral changes, some of which continue after stopping. Warn the parents if you're going to use it. So, what are my protocols? Episodic treatment for episodic problems. The first choice is nothing more than bronchodilators, but I've got to ask myself, does the child need treatment at all? It's not a trivial exercise, giving a mask and space to an inhaler to a vigorous toddler. I do try leukotriene receptor antagonists, but if they don't work out, and I, they usually don't, I discontinue them. I then try intermittent high-dose inhaled steroids, no higher than 400 micrograms a day of bectomethasone equivalent, and monitor them carefully. A counsel of despair is to use combinations of the above. What about multiple trigger wheeze? Well, I recommend a three-step protocol to you to avoid you over-treating children with transient conditions. Step one is to commence treatment with 200 micrograms of beclomethasone and see them in six weeks' time, at which time the treatment will be stopped. And you tell the parents this. You ask at six weeks, is the child better? If the answer is no, they're not steroid sensitive, think of alternative diagnoses and therapies. If the answer is yes, you still stop the treatment because you don't know whether they've got better because you're a frightfully clever doctor or they were going to get better anyway. So you stop the treatment and reassess the child, see them again, have the symptoms recurred. If the answer is no, it was a transient problem, no further action needed. If the answer is yes, then you restart back to methadone and titrate to the lowest dose to control symptoms. And I would really strongly recommend this three-step protocol with a time of trial, uh, trial time off treatment. What about macrolide antibiotics? As you all know, they have multiple anti-inflammatory, antiviral, antibacterial, multiple effects. In this study from Denmark, 72 children with what were called asthma-like episodes, I don't know what that is, lasting at least three days, symptoms were shortened by azithromycin. In this study, they were more stringent. The, to get into the study, you had to have had at least one course of prednisolone. Uh, and if you, if you were given azithromycin, you had less subsequent courses of prednisolone. But in this study from the emergency department in 300 children, no effect of azithromycin. So I suggest that azithromycin may be justifiable in those with acute, really severe wheeze heading for ICU. If you use it widely in the community, you will infallibly drive macrolide resistance up. What about prednisolone for the acute treatment of wheeze? Well, this is a meta-analysis in nearly 1,800 children, 11 studies from outpatients, inpatients, and the emergency department. Overall admissions, no benefit. 
outpatient studies, placebo, fewer admissions, emergency study room studies, small benefit of steroids. So here you can see if you're an outpatient, no effect of prednisolone and whether you get admitted to hospital. Uh, if you get an outpatient, in fact, in this thing, you actually get to do better with placebo. If you're ill enough to get to the emergency department, maybe hospital admissions are reduced. Further results, all comers, if you get prednisolone versus placebo, are you likely to get an extra course of prednisolone? Nope. If you're an inpatient, it may reduce the need for further oral steroids. So here in panel E, the suggestion is that if you're ill enough to be an inpatient, the steroids may be beneficial. But overall, most preschool wheezers do not need steroids. If they're, if, if they're in the community, they certainly don't need steroids, and even in the hospital, many don't. There is a hint of more benefit in sicker patients, and possibly this could be a non-genomic effect of, the, of the prednisolone reducing airway edema. Two studies that I should draw your attention to. This one from the Lancet Respiratory Medicine, 600 odd patients, um, suggesting that if you gave prednisolone, you reduced hospital admissions by 170 minutes, and this was significant. This was a slightly equivocal study. They changed the endpoint halfway through. This is Jonathan Griggs' study in nearly 700 patients, coincidentally exactly the same shortening, 170 minutes, not significant. What do parents think? Well, parents in the audience, if you had a choice between a course of steroids for your child or staying in hospital 170 minutes longer, I think most of us would, start, would prefer not to use steroids. So there is a role for steroids, but not in primary care, not as a routine in secondary care, possibly for multi-trigger wheeze with a severe attack and possibly any severe viral wheeze heading for PICU. So I'm briefly now going to talk about future risk. Will they go on to develop asthma, doctor? Will they get school-age asthma? So this is an ROC with an area under the curve of more than 90, more than 0.9. And the three things that predict persistent asthma in school age are bad attacks of wheeze, aeroallergen sensitization, and exposure to tobacco smoke before the age of three. I'd like briefly to review the developmental course of lung function. This is global lung initiative data, over 100,000 records between two and a half and 95 years. They constructed predictive equations for spirometry. You can see that your lung function increases up to the age of 20 to 25 and then declines. They've calculated ethnic normal ranges, and I think that's wrong. That's a debate for another day. And your lung function depends on how you are when you're born, what happens in childhood, and how quickly you decline. And I'm going to show you that COPD is a childhood illness. This is the ECFS study, nearly 14,000 adults. They enumerated five childhood risk factors, the deprivation factors, maternal, paternal, and childhood asthma, adult smoking, bad respiratory infections, and you can see in this panel, lung function on the vertical axis, um, age on the horizontal axis, and the more of these risk factors you had, the worse was your lung function. And early childhood disadvantage, whether you smoked or not, was associated with lower lung function. It never caught up, and that is key. Your lung function does not catch up. There was a faster rate of decline and more COPD. COPD is a childhood disease. And a low FEV1 is, is significant for more than just COPD. This is the Tucson study, nearly 1,500 participants. They looked at tercels of FEV1 and mortality. 122 died. And you can see as early as the third decade of life, those with the lowest tercile of FEV1 had the highest mortality. And for every 10% decrease in baseline FEV1, there was a 15% increase in all-cause mortality. Really worrying. What about adults, low birth weight in adults? And this is, to start with, this is a coal miner from England with a canary. And he's got a canary down the mine, not because he likes birds and music, but if the canary stops singing, it means the canary is dead from carbon monoxide poisoning, to which it's exquisitely sensitive. 
and the miner has to leg it up to the top or he'll die too. So I'm going to suggest to you that FEV1 is like the canary in the mine, a sign of trouble ahead for all-cause mortality. Why is a clinically trivial lung function loss associated with greater adult mortality? And there are plenty of studies that show this. And 15% of birth weight variability is driven by the fetal genotype. And birth weight, as you know, is a strong determinant of lung function. And the, the genes that determine birth weight also determine type 2 diabetes, glucose metabolism, lipid metabolism, coronary artery disease, blood pressure, all the sorts of things that are really worrying. So if you see a child, a school-aged child with a low FEV1, that's happened before, all the risk factors were before birth in the preschool years, that child is potentially at risk and has a high risk population. Briefly, DNA, maternal smoking and epigenetic changes, a meta-analysis from 18,000 patients uh, looking at peripheral blood methylation, not ideal, and three loci were significantly related to prenatal and adult smoking. You can see that in this top panel here, whether you look just at maternal prenatal smoking or whether you also looked at adult smoking, all eight loci were significantly related to adult smoking, and significantly there was a robust link of these cardiometabolic factors to, to the, the robust link to cardiometabolic risk factors, blood pressure, triglycerides, etc. So we've got a model here: smoking in pregnancy. It affects the developing directly affects the developing lungs and the other systems, causes epigenetic changes lowers your birth weight, which also affects lung function. The epigenetic factors have effects at both, at both, both on the placenta and also on the developing fetus. So finally, can we prevent asthma yet? So something can be done. It's not all in the genes. So the Amish and Hutterites were very genetically similar people. They were communities that fled religious persecution in Europe and went to North America. The Amish continued to use traditional farming methods. The Hutterites switched to the most modern agricultural methods. And you can see from this panel, the red and blue, they are genetically almost identical. And yet, the Amish had much lower prevalence of asthma and atopy, and they related this to much higher lipopolysaccharide and microbiological exposures. You can see huge amounts of endotoxin in the Amish house dust, very little in the Hutterites. The human studies, the Hutterites were eosinophilic, the Amish were neutrophilic. Amish monocytes were suppressive, and the uh, and innate but not adaptive cytokines were higher in Amish children. In, for, in murine studies, Hutterite dust-treated mice who were challenged with an allergen had more airway eosinophilia, but Amish dust inhalation inhibited mouse allergic airways disease. BAL cytokines were suppressed by Amish dust, and this was modulated through the innate immune system. So something can be done. Here's proof of concept. A lot of genes were, were up and down regulated, as you can see in this volcano plot. But we have scope to intervene. That's the message of this study. And we must also focus on things that we know work. Smoke-free legislation. So this is Ben Nemery's study from Flanders. He looked at the way at the at different pieces of legislation, all of which tightened the noose around the tobacco, less and less scope to smoke in public. And they looked at over half a million singleton spontaneous deliveries. The outcome was preterm birth, less than 37 weeks. And look, every time there was some legislation, um, preterm birth fell. We have got to protect our children from secondhand smoke. Banning smoking in public. This is, this is a benefit to those like waiters who are occupationally exposed, but what about the innocent bystanders, children? This study looked at asthma admissions in Scotland, and before the smoking ban in public, asthma admissions were going up by about 5% a year. After the ban, they fell by nearly 20% a year, Look at that for a dramatic result. We have got to protect them. This affected all ages, all socioeconomic statuses. What about tobacco in cars, smoking in front of children? 
This is a UK study looking at the effect of the ban of, on smoking in cars, children reporting exposure to cigarette smoke, and the English ban was associated with an absolute decline in exposure. Legislation works. This is what happened in England with the ban. Dramatic effects. What about e-cigarettes? I don't know if you have a problem with vaping. That's a jewel in the top right corner. I don't know if you have a problem with this in India, but by God, you will if you, if you don't already. So look out and be ready for them. What about the passive effects of vaping? So what this group did, they took nine volunteers who vaped nicotine-containing and nicotine-free cigarettes. All were occasional tobacco smokers. Note, incidentally, there was far more nicotine in the e-cigarettes than was on the packaged label. What they found was all sorts of different chemicals in the, in the gas that was being ex uh, inhaled passively. And in the urine of those who were passively exposed, increased nicotine, increased cotinine, and increased other chemicals. Do you want our children to passively inhale this stuff? Get ready to repel borders, because that's the new way that tobacco companies are making money. What about pollution? I know very important in India. So this is a study of 600 children who had spirometry done at the age of four and a half years. And they looked at residential exposure to benzene and nitrogen dioxide. And you can see that for both benzene and nitrogen dioxide, the more there was exposure in pregnancy, the lower was the FEV1 at four and a half and five years. And for this study, but not for others, it was a particular pregnancy effect. And it was worse if your child was allergic and worse if you came from low socioeconomic status. This is an American study. Again, we've got to pressurize our legislators. We must, must, must protect our children. This is the South California Children's Health Study. Three co five year cohorts starting at mean 11 um, from 1984, 1997 and 2007. They had annual spirometry and air quality as the state government in, tightened the noose on those pollutants, air quality improved and lung growth improved. Here you can see FVC, here you can see FEV1. Note that the x-axis is rather confusing, it's going in the opposite direction, so zero is here, not here. So this is low pollution. In each case, you can see in successive cohorts, you can see as the pollution improved, FEV1 and FVC also improved. Legislation works. Something else can be done. This is one uh, this, an intervention study in pregnancy, comparing olive oil placebo with fish oil in Denmark. Um, over 700 pregnant women randomized, followed up, 96% follow up to three years, the primary endpoint was wheezing at three years, and the risk of persistent wheeze was less with fish oil, especially in mothers who had low metabolites in the blood or low intake. And, though, and you can see here the effect. There is, there, there's placebo, there's fish oil, uh, less wheeze at three years. And there was an interaction of maternal fatty acid desaturase genotype. What about vitamin D in pregnancy? And this is a disappointment. The VDART study with high dose supplementation in vitamin D versus standard supplementation at age three, a small trend for a benefit. A similar study was done in Denmark, not itself significant, but when they were combined, there was a significant effect. Was this through antiviral immunity? But at age six, there was no difference. And you can see here, that's the VDART study. By age six, no difference in the vitamin D or control. Again, by age six in the Danish study, absolutely no benefit. Disappointing. So in summary, what are my take home messages? The first is the clinical one. Preschool wheeze fits into one of five groups. You need your careful clinical skills, history and physical examination for that categorization, some targeted tests in some. We are on the verge of personalized medicine for preschool wheeze, and that's the way we must go, rather than just putting steroids in the tap water or asking parents about symptoms. That's not good enough for the 21st century. If you've got a child with acute attacks, atopic sensitization, and tobacco exposure, this is a high risk group, not just for COPD in adult life, but for all cause mortality. 
and we're getting close to strategies to move beyond palliative care in, in steroids and bronchodilators for symptoms to actually preventing the disease. Perhaps the Amish health right and other studies gives a tantalizing hint that bacteria may be important. And before you laugh too loudly, remember years ago, duodenal ulcer, was, there was a, a pathologist who said, I can see spirochetes in duodenal ulcers, and everybody just laughed their heads off. Ridiculous. But we're now treating duodenal ulcer with antibiotics because it's caused by helicobacter. Is there an asthma helicobacter? A challenge for you young investigators listening. So I'd like to thank you for listening. I'd leave you, leave you with this picture of my six grandchildren. We've got to protect their lungs. Uh, I hope this was useful. Do please email me if I can answer any questions for you. I'm very happy to take questions now. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Boone. Uh, outstanding talk, ranging from the clinical to the uh, therapeutics to prevention to progress of the disease. We have a lot of questions here, and I will start off with uh, one of them from a very uh, uh, famous pulmonologist. What about lung function testing in uh, preschool V's? And that's a very good question. Thank you. And before I answer any questions, I would like publicly to thank your audiovisual team who were so helpful getting that recording done when I was running into technical problems over the weekend. So a big thank you to them. So lung function measurements, yes. If you, there, there is evidence that if you have a good technician or a good respiratory nurse, you can get, you can get two, three, four year olds to do spirometry. There was a paper from Argentina in Thorax looking at, looking at perhaps documenting bronchodilator reversibility. There are various clever incentive programs like blowing out the candles on a cake on the screen and things like that that can help. But the absolute key is to, is to, is to get the technician who is interested. Lung clearance index is also can be used. It's perhaps less valuable for measuring bronchodilator reversibility. Um, for, um, the FOT technique I've got no personal experience with. People like Professor Peter Sly have used that much more than I have. I certainly think we should be working towards trying to measure lung function as we do in older children. We've got to move to giving these preschool children the same sort of service as our, uh, as our older children get. Thank you, Dr. Bush. The other question was regarding respiratory microbiome and how it has evolved over time. Can you just share your uh, thoughts it's on that? It's fascinating. And one really important lesson that will always be true is that the more confidently somebody old and senior like me tells you something is true, the more certain you can be that, that, that they're wrong. So I was taught as a student that the lungs were sterile. And when you think about it, that's absolutely ridiculous. Think how many thousands of liters of air are going to and fro. So we know that the microbiome is, in, is there. We know a normal microbiome is important. If you raise mice in germ-free environments, that, 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 that uh, they, ha they have enhanced allergic responses. Um, my colleague, Professor Saglani, has some centralizing data suggestive that there may be that Moroxella, uh, uh, a Moroxella predominant microbiome cluster may be important. Watch this space. I do believe that bacteria may be very important. And for the young investigators, that's where I, you know, that's where I go and make my name. Go for it. Uh, there was a German study which uh, gave antibiotics for prolonged periods of time uh, for those with neutrophilic uh, predominance in the, um, in the airway. Any comments on that study, please? Yes, I know it's always very difficult in terms of using a, a neutrophilic airway disease. When I see it, makes me think of things like bronchiectasis, primary cirrhosis kinesia, cystic fibrosis, persistent bacterial bronchitis. If you've got infection in the airways, obviously treat it. It's all, the, the question then is why have you got infection in the airways? Is there some underlying immunodeficiency? either mucosal or systemic, is there a foreign body, all those sorts of things. The trouble as you, we all of course know, if you give out lots of antibiotics in the community, you will drive antibiotic resistance and they won't be there to treat serious bacterial infections. 
the other um, question which has been asked is about airway in eosinophilia is difficult to measure can we use blood eosinophilia as a surrogate well i think it's a really important question i think what we can say in any context is that if you don't on the data that we have so far if there is no blood eosinophilia you probably don't have airway eosinophilia and therefore probably will not respond to inhaled steroids although that does need to be tested if you have a raised blood eosinophil count in my country, that could be due to another atopic allergic disease like an allergic rhinitis uh, or eczema. We don't, I don't see very much parasitic disease. Speaking to friends in Costa Rica, they tell me all their patients have got a 5% blood eosinophil count or more because of parasites. This is why I mean, when is one of the difficulties within umbrella terms like asthma is people, if they don't think, think, well, London asthma is the same as Delhi or Mumbai asthma, as the same as, as uh, asthma, in, asthma in, the, in the townships of South Africa. It may not be. The environmental burdens of pollution and bacteria are different. The genotypes may be different. Young investigators go out and find out more about the Indian disease. It's a diversion, but there's a fantastic project looking at interstitial lung disease in adults in India, a collaboration between numerous Indian centers and I think, I think Washington University. And the pattern of interstitial lung disease was completely different in India. About 50% for hypersensitivity pneumonitis from water coolers. So you know, look, look, and, look and see what's really going on in your patch. Thank you. Um, there's another question, interesting question. Can you get asthma without cough? You can. Uh, what is, you can get, you can get, you can. If you, but obviously wheeze is just a noise, as I think was highlighted very nicely in the first talk. There are many different way, ways of wheezing. Uh, just, it just means that the airway is narrow. Uh, it could be due to mucus, um, could be due to airway instability. Generally, as do asthmatics do cough, but I would stress, sir, I don't know what it's like in India, but I do know that in England, we have, we have overdiagnosed cough variant asthma. Right, sir. Uh, there's another interesting question on whether the classification of episodic V's and multi-trigger V's is obsolete now. So, so the, classif the, the trouble with the, the classification has strengths and weaknesses. The weakness is to say if the virus is, episode, is just episodic symptoms, you 100% rely on parental perception of symptoms. If the parents don't particularly notice symptoms, you'll misdiagnose it. You also need to be aware as the, as the tempo of the illness evolves, some of them may get better completely. Uh, some may go on to multiple trigger wheeze, Multiple trigger wheezes, if you give them steroids, may go back to, to just a viral wheeze. And the data we have increasingly is that if you look at the pathology, both of these are umbrella terms. Some are eosinophilic and need steroids, and some are not eosinophilic and don't. And I think, you know, we've got to get in, I think we've got to get into our bloodstreams as pediatric pulmonologists. Just as you measure somebody's blood pressure before you give them antihypertensives, we've got to be trying to measure if airway eosinophilia before they're giving anti eosinophil therapies. On the same grounds, there is another interesting question on exhaled nitric oxide in preschool geysers. Do you do it and is it of any use? So, yes, we do do it. It's a research technique. That we, what we use is an offline collection, so collecting tidal, tidally exhaled breath into a, into a, a special bag. Uh, it's one pointer towards, if, the, if, it, if it's raised, it can be a sign of atopy, it can be a sign of airway eosinophilia. It's one pointer. I think we should use it more, but at the moment, it is a research technique, and it is also, you know, it's, it's, it's a a difficult technique to do. You need experienced technical help. Thank you. Uh, the other question is on: Do you have you? Is there any role for checking uh, inflammatory markers other than eosinophils for in 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 under, under five E's? 
Well, the questioner is right. There should be, is the answer. We, sh we need to know far more about what is going on in the airway of these children. There is no question of that. We need to get, we need to get more information. Again, a challenge to the, to the young investigators. Collecting exhaled breath, I, mean, I don't know if you've seen particularly some of the adult studies, it's astonishing the breath prints you can get from just co collecting passively exhaled breath and using mass spectrometry. We ought to be doing that sort of, we ought to be doing that sort of thing uh, in, in, in our preschool children to try to get a pathological handprint of what's going on in their airway. Uh, isn't it depressing how, when you think how, how, for example, the adult rheumatologists have dissected the different types of arthritis, the hematologists with their biomarkers for the different leukemias, and we're stuck still a long way, a long way off the curve. We need to do better. The other question is on use of biologicals in under five years. Have you used any? The answer is I have not. Um, the, they are not there. They are only licensed in my country for six and over. There is interest that, that I mean, clearly, if you saw a four-year-old who's covered covered in eczema, has got a has got a raised bloody eosinophil count or a raised IgE, getting lots of asthma attacks then you might well think a biological would be a, a useful thing to do. I'm just not able to do it in my country. There is also an interesting study going on. I haven't seen any data trying to test the hypothesis that if you give a biological to a preschool wheezer, will you stop asthma developing? And I haven't seen those data and I'd be very interested to see what they show. Another very common test which is done in uh, India is the IgE levels and uh, specific IgE levels in particular. So how would you address this? So a total IgE can be very non-specific. obviously. Again, parasites, all sorts of things. Specific IgE and skin prick tests give you different but overlapping information. Um, a skin prick test is a lot cheaper. And if I saw, I mean, increasingly at the moment in my country, and I don't know whether it would be right in India or even in some parts of India, I'm increasingly using a combination of, of aeroallergen sensitization and a raised bloody eosinophil count to guide whether I'm, whether I'm giving steroids or not. Um, you need to, you need to, you need the tests in the results in India. I think always with tests, obviously, you've got to think, what am I going to do with the answer? Uh, before uh, before I do it. Now again, I don't know about India, but in England we are absolutely obsessed with furry pets. Cats and dogs much more important than children. And if we can get if if I've got somebody with troublesome wheeze and I, they're sensitised to cats and do, uh, to their pet, I'm afraid I'm very bullish and say you've got to get rid of that pet. Not popular. <laughs> um... Another, another question is on the role of uh, uh, something called as a respiratory probiotic. There are, there are many things marketed as probiotics to prevent asthma. Absolutely, absolutely fascinating. And I congratulate the questioner on this question. So there is, I don't, in Europe, it's uh, bronchobaxon is the, is the preparation. And it's very popular. And Fernando Martinez, who's the director of the Tucson study, he said when he was growing up in Italy, he was a young pediatric pulmonologist, he was telling parents, this stuff is a waste of time, don't use it. He's now doing a randomized control trial of bronchofaxon to see if it prevents the development of asthma, because there's a, the evidence uh, from a lot of farm studies is that a farming environment where there's Cow, cow dung all over the place and straw and looks terribly insanitary lots of bacteria is actually protective so maybe if we gave bronchobaxin uh, that would be protective but that's the subject of a controlled trial personally i wouldn't use it. i wouldn't use it um, but it's ironic to fernando that having spent half his life persuading mothers not to use it he's now doing a big multi-million dollar trial funded by the nih of this preparation the other very interesting question is, we have seen in India a dramatic fall in wheezing disorders after COVID has struck. So has it been the experience all over the world? So we have seen, uh, we have seen falls in prevalence. Uh, in COVID, there's been particularly, there's the, the data that 
pollution has pollution has fallen. There's some dramatic pictures of that. The fact that children aren't mixing with each other means they're not passing viral colds round and round. And certainly in COVID, uh, even before COVID actually, but in COVID certainly, uh, emergency department visits for wheeze and asthma have dropped. Is that the case in India? Very much so. We, yeah. we, are, we are not seeing any, any, any major problems right now. Yeah. And pollution, I think also or, or also not passing on wheezes. Certainly in my country, I don't know whether it's true in India, parents are worried about traveling and they're worried about coming to a crowded hospital and picking up an infection there. It, I don't know if it's the same in India. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So I think a lot of things. Now the last question I had and the last question which is from me is, um, do you think that RSV vaccination of mothers will prevent wheezing in children? Under five weeks. It's fascinating. So there are two, there are two separate components to this. We know that RSV is a potent cause of wheezing illness in very young children. We we know that that palivizumab, for example, um, reduces wheezing very early on in life. I think the data on maternal immunization have been controversial. I think there's a signal that it is worthwhile. Um, I think we're close to that. The most interesting question, does RSV infection cause subsequent school age eosinophilic asthma? There's a, the answer to that is almost certainly no. And anybody who wants the last word on that should read in the Lancet Respiratory Medicine as a meta-analysis of the various different intervention studies and they showed that in school age asthma the effect has disappeared but in preschool we said maybe a te te temporary effect thank you dr bush i think we have come to the end of all our questions now and i thank you for a super session okay we enjoyed ourselves it's late at night in india we are almost uh, uh, reaching 10 30 at night and i think we have been a, we have had a fantastic evening uh, listening to you and the entire uh, spectrum of under five Vs. I'll now hand it over to Dr. Subramaniam for his. Well, thank you. It's my honor. It's my great thank honor to, to, to do this. And I, it's such an honor. So many people and such enthusiasm. It's a great tribute to the Indian chapter. And if I can help again in the future, please don't forget where I am. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, sir, uh, thank you, Dr. Jagdish and uh, Dr. Bush for uh, that wonderful deliberations. But as I, as I was interacting with most of the delegates, so can I also have a couple of queries to you from my personal end? Of course. Yeah. Um, what can be some kind of cutoff age for asthma? Is there, is there something like asthma? Do not diagnose below two years, two and a half years. If you could tell for general average pediatrician, you know, not taking anything else into consideration. Yeah. Well, I think they've got to be clear. What, are they, what do they mean by asthma? And the trouble with the term, it's been hijacked by the adult doctors. Adult asthma equals give them, in, give them inhaled steroids. And that can be so wrong for the wheezing preschool child. So I think I'd say to them, if they've got, if they've got wheezing is troublesome, it's worth getting somebody, you know, a pediatric, an Indian pediatric pulmonologist to take a look at them and see, you know, do they have airway eosinophilia? I think, you know, we've, we've, I, you know, in my professional career, I've been too sloppy and just asking parents, you know, what's going on. And actually we need to make measurements. And that's what I would urge your questioner to, to, to be doing. And if they don't have the facilities and the child is ill, get them to see someone else. A lot of pediatricians over here have some kind of uh, questions that are frequently asked in most of the conferences about the type of the device that they have to use. See, for example, I would just give an example of a six months old baby, which, which is forced for an nebulizer, one and a half year forced for a nebulizer, three, three, four, five. You know, if you were to split the age across the device, how would you, how would you, advice that's a very important question and the first thing to say is the people who have the most skills with helping parents to use devices which is challenging are the respiratory nurses we don't actually use nebulizer i can't remember the last time i prescribed a nebulizer to a preschool child we we use small volume spacers like the able spacer or the aero chamber uh, with a with a mask now, Heather Zahn and others have done work suggesting you can convert 
a, a plastic bottle for you know for cheapness for a plastic bottle into a into a spacer. The important thing is to spend time with the parents to try to get them to see how to use to use it. Make a game with the child. Don't frighten the child by sort of rushing rushing at them with a, putting a great mask on their heads. Our nurses are much much more skillful than I am at that. And lastly, only one question. Uh, my apologies, uh, but no uh, now no, the question was that which I also faced in many of the attend uh, where I attended was that which steroid to use and refi you know even you can answer off label no problem is it fluticasone or is it bidacinide or is it something else so i would just use the cheapest quite honestly there's no been no comparative studies what i do what i do what the very potent topical steroids worry me a bit and the reason they do is because as you know the airway has got a complicated immune system to prevent prevents us dying every time we inhale a bacterium. We know that systemic steroids are immunosuppressive and there's increasing evidence that powerful topical steroids are as well. So in COPD, there's a greater prevalence of pneumonia if you treat them with steroids. There's a greater prevalence of TB. There's a greater prevalence of atypical mycobacteria. Again, I'm a stress. I'm not saying don't use steroids. That would be ridiculous. But I am saying there is an argument, for not just a financial one, but a side effects one. There's an argument for making sure you target them accurately to the people who need it. And, and the last question, um, because this is again a question of, uh, I mean, debates and controversies. Do you advise skin prick tests as a measure of sensitization and therefore a decision or do you bank on clinical diagnosis as far as under five easing is concerned? I prefer to use skin prick tests or, or if they're on antihistamines or blood tests, I prefer to document it uh, if, I pos if I possibly can. Now again, I don't, you, you, I don't know what the prevalence of ATP is across India than the different, you started at the beginning pointing out rightly what a diverse multicultural society India is. And anybody like me who's been there more than about five minutes can appreciate. I remember going to a craft fair outside Delhi. It just blew my mind away, all the cultural diversity. So you need to know, you know if, if A to P has a prevalence of less than 1%, you're probably not going to waste your time doing any skin tests. If it's 30%, then you should. Okay. It depends on whether it is atopic or non-atopic, Easy. Fair enough. I think we had, uh, we will be having some more questions, uh, uh, Professor Bush. What I would wish is that, and what I would assure the participants today is that post all the questions by WhatsApp or email to us. And we will also probably email to you and try to get some kind of response. And then we will, uh, we will release it as a kind of document for all the participants for their benefit. So continue to post your questions. Probably, if possible, we will have session two of uh, uh, wheezing. If if uh, if there is, we will take a feedback from the audience if there are unanswered uh, like thirst of uh, academics. Then we would we would look in for it. Otherwise, we would go for one more topic. But uh, Professor Bush, we would inform you and invite you for every session. And I don't know if you could spend a couple of minutes at, at the end of the day. I'm, I'm sorry, but taking time out of you and with your busy clinic, it was so nice and graceful to have you. And I just wanted to tell you that there were more than thousand registrations, more than any, uh, any ordinary conference of national level that you would have. So that's the kind of uh, affection and, and the kind of gratitude our people have for you. And, uh, and from my country, and on behalf of the respiratory chapter, wholeheartedly we'll thank you. We'll thank, thank Dr. Jagdish Chanappa for moderating today's session. And lastly, a wonderful audience who have responded to us just in a notice of two or three days. There was a, the, the, the number reached more than 1,000. And um, it was wonderful to uh, interact with you. So we hope so that we will catch up uh, you again and again and some kind of trouble for us please, for the sake of respirology, which you have been doing properly. And do please email me questions. I'm very happy to help. 
I'm going on annual leave at the end of the week, so there may be a little delay, but I promise you I will answer the questions in emails. And thank you for honoring me with the invitation from the chat. We would, we would email you questions with the, with the nice graphics from my end so that you can you can answer and then we'll release it almost like a movie. I mean, that 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 may be our dream and let's see how, how that goes. And thank you very much. And um, dear viewers, thank you very much. And um, greetings from us. And we'll meet you next Monday at 9 p.m. And we'll announce and uh, release the uh, topics for you. Please log in and have a nice uh, beginning of the week with academics at 9 p.m. Indian Standard Time. And thank you very much. And uh, the next time we will open it for people from abroad. There are a lot of people who called me and told me he wanted to listen to Dr. Professor Bush from UK. But uh, the lines were only allowed for Indian viewers. I'm sorry, sir. Next time we'll make it that at least all of your students across the globe would listen and uh, love to have you and thank you very much and uh, we would close the session and if there are if there is any final word from you dr bush you can just have a word and then i think we'll close it off well just to say thank you sleep well it's been a very great pleasure and i hope i will be asked again i thank you to the indian chapter and i'm looking forward to coming back to india for indian culture and some cricket Thank you. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you.